Did you know that ticket prices can actually go down right before the game? That's where game time comes in. Game time tracks ticket prices in real time from thousands of trusted sellers, then shows you all the best deals. So we can get tickets at the last minute for up to 60% off. Download game time now. Happy Friday, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome into the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. How we doing? I'm Cam Rogers. Who else would I be? Follow me on Twitter at Mr. Rogers 99. Quite a program on tap for you as we take you up until 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So it's a little bit of a shorter list because we have a lot to get to with my way too early NFL power rankings. But in a matter of moments, I will be talking about the NBA trade deadline. It has come and gone. I am recapping the top five trades from yesterday. I'll tell you all my insight as we go throughout those. And as you see at the 10 minute mark, I will kick off my NFL power rankings. And then to wrap up the show, I'll be chatting with Patriots team reporter Meredith Gorman. She, of course, was just in Minneapolis covering Super Bowl 52 between those Patriots and Eagles. Came out on the rough end, of course, losing, but still looking forward to chatting with her towards the 45-minute mark. Time permitting, a little interesting note about the Patriots and a fake story that went out on the Boston Herald and then eventually took off the website. I'll tell you about it with time permitting on the Cam Rogers Show, which is presented by the Game Time app. Get up to 60% off all those last minute sports tickets, concert tickets, and so much more. Chatsports.com slash tickets is the website to go ahead and download that app. All right, folks, let's get into the NBA trade deadline as we want your thoughts. Who won the deadline yesterday? Give us a heart for the Cavs, a like for the Lakers, a laughing face for Dwayne Wade. He goes back to the heat or an angry face for the New York Knicks. Throw in your respective votes here on Facebook Live. I've got my broadcast on my laptop right next to me. I am tracking what you say and continue to throw in your thoughts in the comments section as well. Wendy chiming in in the comments section saying please give me a shout out wendy a shout out to you thank you for tuning in for the cam show here on this friday morning hope your weekend is getting started off well all right let's go through the trades here ladies and gentlemen we'll start off with the lakers and the Cavs. so here's what went down poor it right isaiah thomas on the move so he goes to LA along with Channing Fry and a Cavaliers 2018 first round pick. The Cavs get Clarkson and Larry Nance Jr. So the big storyline here is what Cavs GM Kobe Altman recently said. Quote, we felt like we were on a slow death march and that's not something I wanted to be a part of. So rumors were swirling with the Cavaliers that there was a lot of finger pointing going on within the locker room. And Isaiah Thomas was at the forefront of that finger pointing. So the Cavaliers, they let go of a lot of players, traded away a lot of guys, a lot of turnover. I'm thinking Monday morning for the Cavs and the Cavs leadership, it's going to be like employee or orientation because there are so many new people going to the Cavs. So Isaiah Thomas, LA, is he even going to start? That is the question for me. Of course, Lonzo Ball, priority number one. Could Isaiah start with Ball? Maybe. I just don't see it. I doubt Isaiah Thomas is really thrilled to be the sixth man for the LA Lakers, but that very could be the possibility for him. Channing Fry, don't expect either of these two to be bought out, by the way. Talking about IT and Fry, uh, they will probably be with the Lakers. And then, of course, that 2018 first round pick, which is protected. Cavaliers, Jordan Clarkson, huge for the Lakers to clear Clarkson's contract, allowing them to offer two maximum contracts next summer, including perhaps LeBron James. Larry Nance Jr., I think he provides good athleticism there for the Cavaliers and uh, good explosiveness on that front court too. Now, L.A., this is all about, it seemed to me, Clearing space for big time splashes in free agency. More specifically, LeBron James. The LeBron James sweepstakes is on for LA. And for the Lakers to get rid of Clarkson's contract is part of that process. And you're hearing about it in the storylines and throughout the media scope that LA is ready to make that big time push. 
Uh, Isaiah Thomas, I'm sure they're not absolutely thrilled about getting this guy, especially considering he might be coming off the bench. But I think they are more thrilled about letting go of Clarkson and his contract. And in essence, it's addition by subtraction here. So the addition of Clarkson and Nance come with a price for the Cavaliers, of course. Frees up space for the Lakers. And it's tough to tell if the Cavs actually won all of these trades long term. In the short term, everybody's talking about the Cavaliers. They won the trade deadline. But to me, I feel in terms of the broad scope, the macro perspective here, perhaps the winner is more of the L.A. Lakers. If you want to think about long term and perhaps LeBron James going to L.A. We'll go into the next tier trade involving the Cavaliers again. We got the Jazz, we got the Kings and the Cavs in a three-way trade. So the Jazz get Crowder and Derrick Rose. Poor Derrick Rose right now. I mean, everybody's saying that. It could be the beginning of the end for him in terms of his career. Cavs get George Hill and Rodney Hood. Kings get Shump, Joe Johnson, and a 2020 second round pick. So I want to kind of touch upon here the changes and the improvements for the Cavaliers with all of these moves that they have made. Uh, so projections using the multi-year predictive version of ESPN's real plus minus system called RPM don't suggest this Cavaliers roster is in the same class as the Warriors, but still improved. So RPM projects Cleveland as nearly average defensively, which is actually an improvement because this team currently ranks 29th in defensive rating. However, the projection of an offense 2.9 points per 100 possessions better than the league average would actually be slightly worse than what the Cavaliers have been really sporting to this point. So they got better on defense, according to these projections, perhaps they're an average defense now, but the offense, according to these RPM metrics, actually took a step back here. All right, so Rodney Hood, I think will provide good wing rotation ability. You talk about George Hill, Cavs are a lot more dynamic today than they were yesterday, or beginning of yesterday, I should say. Hood and Hill will help and the Cavs didn't have to trade the Brooklyn pick either, which I think is important. All right, the Jazz, Derrick Rose. Is there anybody out there that actually wants Derrick at this point? He's going to be bought out most likely, but reports suggest that Tom Thibodeau's Timberwolves may be interested in Derrick Rose, and reports have swirled that Rose has considered retirement. You may re remember that report all the way back in November. He really didn't trust uh, or he, he essentially refuted that media report. Uh, but still, there's something there with Derrick Rose. And then Jay Crowder, I think Coach Quinn Snyder's system is a good fit for him. Crowder looked out of place for the really entire tenure he was with Cleveland. I expect more shots from beyond the arc from Crowder as he plays for the Jazz. And then the Kings, Joe Johnson, I think the Kings will buy him out. And the Celtics and Warriors are reportedly in the running for that shooting guard there. So those are the big storylines out of that trade. How about the Cavs and Heat? So the Cavs get a second round pick. The Heat get their guy back, Dwayne Wade. I think this was more of a nice gesture from the Cavaliers because Dwayne Wade really never wanted to leave Miami. You had that really awesome bromance between Wade and LeBron James that you know really worked out nicely for the interviews and all of that. But in terms of the X's and O's and on the hardwood, you know, Wayne wanted to go back home. So the Cavaliers deal him, and Wade can probably finish his career with the Miami Heat. Let's take a look at the Nuggets, Knicks, and Mavs here. So the Knicks get Moutier, and the, the Nuggets really wanted to see what they had in Moutier and Jamal Murray, and I guess Denver saw Moutier as more expendable here. But he's just 21 years old. He was the seventh overall pick in 2015. So the Knicks want to see what they have in him. Knicks also get a 2018 second round pick from Denver. Denver getting Devin Harris and a 2018 second round pick. And Dallas gets Doug McDermott and a future second round pick from Denver via Portland. So that is another big time trade that happened yesterday. And as I go through these trades, ladies and gentlemen, let me know who you think 
won the deadline yesterday. I'm seeing a lot of comments and thoughts about the LA Lakers, and many people think the Cavs also won the deadline yesterday. So there is actually a trade without the Cleveland Cavaliers between or among the Nuggets, Knicks, and Mavs there. Let's take a look at the Magic and the Suns here. So what went down with this one? Alfred Payton, he goes to the Phoenix Suns. The Magic get a Suns 2018 second round pick. Payton is a registered, or excuse me, a restricted free agent this summer, but is in the midst of his best offensive season, averaging 13.6 assists per game on a career high of 52% shooting so the Suns get a pretty darn good shooter at least a guy carrying a lot of momentum this season the Magic get a 2018 second round pick so those are the big time trades across the NBA trade deadline and boy was it a fun fun mid-afternoon mid-morning yesterday getting all this news obviously I think the Isaiah Thomas trade was the biggest one yesterday going to the LA Lakers so who won the NBA trade deadline yesterday? Your options are the Cavs, the Lakers, Dwayne Wade going back home to the Miami Heat, or the New York Knicks. And I'm interested to see what people's thoughts are on the Knicks and, you know, of course, their moves that went down yesterday getting Moody, a, uh, I think, will be a solid pickup for them. And uh, the Lakers, I think, is probably going to be the most popular vote as I watch all the reactions flowing in here on the Cam Rogers Show. Getting a lot of likes here, seeing some hearts. Raphael chiming in, the Lakers won it. Mitchell Renz, the Lakers if they get LeBron, which I think is the plan in terms of longevity. And I think that's a good point because if you want to think about, you know, all the way down the line into free agency, the winner at the end of the day may just be the L.A. Lakers and not the Cleveland Cavs. The Cavs may have won the short term, but I think L.A. won the long term. All right, folks, there you go. A little recap of the NBA trade deadline. This is the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. Are you on the go? Do you have to move on this Friday? Don't you worry. You can get me wherever you go. Head on to chatsports.com slash cam show. Download the podcast version for iTunes users out there. And I know it's a busy weekend, and you guys, you know, you can't stay for the entire broadcast. That's one way to get me wherever you go. And by the way, leave a review. If you're feeling generous, leave a little review, five stars, if you're feeling really, really generous, and write a little blurb about the Cam Rogers Show. We appreciate all of the support. Episode 62 here today. Throw in your comments, too, as we go throughout the program. Follow me on Twitter at MrRogers99. I just recapped the NBA trade deadline. It was an exciting day at that. We're going to transition a little bit into the NFL. I'm going to talk about my way too early NFL power rankings. So I will count you down from number 32 all the way down to number one. And then later in the show, Meredith Gorman will join me. She is the Patriots team reporter. She'll talk about her experience at Super Bowl 52 and some major storylines to kind of track throughout the offseason for the New England Patriots. So one more time, Cam Rogers Show podcast version, chatsports.com slash cam show and you can get me wherever you go let's take a look at my first batch of nfl power rankings here so cleveland browns new york giants new york jets and the indianapolis colts 32 through 29 any major disagreements there ladies and gentlemen i doubt but let's take a look at the thoughts here so first of all the cleveland browns they have so much cap space it's unbelievable the second most according to OverTheCap.com. And they have a good amount of draft capital, too. Of course, they have that number one overall pick. They have that number four overall pick, thanks to the Houston Texans. So they may go Sam Darnold, Josh Rosen, number one overall. They may go perhaps Saquon Barkley at number four overall. So they could make some big-time splashes. So, look, let's take a look at Cleveland in terms of their team needs, salary cap space, all that good jazz. So we got quarterback, corner, safety, tackle, running back, all potential team needs here for Cleveland. Couple of free agents to monitor here. Of course, Josh Gordon, in theory, is a free agent, but he is an exclusive rights free agent, which means the Cleveland Browns essentially own Josh Gordon. 
So he's not going anywhere. Isaiah Crowell is an interesting name to monitor there at the running back position. But the Browns the last two seasons, 1-31. and 31. So for Cleveland, they're going to have to figure it out in 2018. More notably, Hugh Jackson as the coach. And John Dorsey, the GM there, giving Jackson his endorsement. We'll see what Cleveland can do with all that cap space. Perhaps they go out and address the wide receiver position. Maybe they grab a Jarvis Landry. Perhaps they go out and grab a Kirk Cousins. They'll certainly be in the Cousins sweepstakes. But I really think Cleveland has a ceiling of perhaps seven wins next year. I'm telling you guys, they're at 32 right now because they literally just finished the year 0-16. But they have a lot of room to improve because of the draft capital that they have and the salary cap space. So there's the Cleveland Browns there at number 32. You also saw the Giants on that original graphic. There they are at number 31. Noel Dell Beckham Jr. last year. No Brandon Marshall last year for part of the year as well because of those injuries. And the Giants really felt the brunt of all that because they were trotting out King at the uh, wide receiver position and uh, some other players that really just weren't up to snuff. So poor Eli Manning, the guy was under duress. They got to address the offensive line. You see the salary cap space, not the most in the world. So they're going to have to make some salary cap cuts. Perhaps Eric Flowers, he has been struggling mightily at left tackle. Some other names to monitor. Brandon Marshall, they may cut him. But I think the defense has still top 10 potential. They just didn't live up to it last year. They certainly were good on that side of the ball in 2016. Pat Shermer, new head coach there. We'll see what he can do with the Giants because, well, Shermer's got a lot of work to do. And he did wonders with Case Keenum. Can he do wonders with the Giants on that offensive side? Justin Pugh is a free agent guard there, and uh, they would love to bring him back. If they don't, perhaps they try and grab Andrew Norwell. All right, so the Giants are at 32. We'll stay with the New York theme. The Jets are at 30, finishing 2017 at 5 and 11. Good amount of cap space. They'll certainly be in the Kirk Cousins running. And I'm thinking they might pick up Sheldon Richardson. He's going to be a free agent. I think the rumors are swirling and making sense to me that the Jets and Richardson may have a, a reunion in store, which I think would be important to pr provide some veteran leadership on that defensive front there. The offensive line was not all that great. And so the Jets are going to have to address that. You see Josh McCown, a free agent, probably won't re-sign him. Obviously, he's not the long-term answer. So we know Bryce Petty. We know Christian Hackenberg are probably not the long-term answers either. So the Jets could go in two directions here. They could jump on the Kirk Cousins, Case Keenum, sweepstakes, bandwagon. Or they could go to the draft and maybe try to grab a Baker Mayfield. I don't think Darnold and Rosen will drop to the Jets. They're at number 30. The Jets at 5-11, and 11, all things considered. Not a bad season when everybody thought they were going to go 0-16. All right, Indianapolis Colts. They're at number 29, $84 million in current salary cap space. That number will increase for the projected amount. So what do the Colts need? They need to address the interior of that offensive line. Ryan Kelly will come back at center. He's important. you got Anthony Costanzo at left tackle as well. But other than that, the Colts should probably think about drafting Quentin Nelson in that first round of the draft. Perhaps they take a look at Saquon Barkley as well. But the Colts in the secondary, they struggled there. Jabal Sheard had a great year on that defense, but aside from him on that front seven, not all that great. So Indianapolis will have to address that defense. But I think priority number one will be protecting Andrew Luck. And that should be the priority for whoever becomes the new head coach there. Because we don't know yet. They're going to interview Frank Reich and uh, see what they get out of him. Some other names to watch out for. They've thrown around David Shaw. I, I say they. Vegas has as Vegas odds are out there for David Shaw to be the head coach of the Colts. Probably not going to happen. Frank Reich is a possibility. Dave Taub is a possibility. Special teams coach for the Chiefs. Let us know who the Colts should hire at head coach. Throw in your comments in the comment section here on the Cam Rogers Show. We'll be sure to address them. All right, so the Colts are at number 29. Let's take a look at number 28 now. The Cincinnati Bengals. 
They played spoiler at the end of last year, beating the Lions and really hurting their chances at the playoffs and beating my Baltimore Ravens in that awful, awful final game. And I'm about to burst out in tears just thinking about it. So backstory here, ladies and gentlemen, and you may find this interesting. So there was a part in that Cincinnati Bengals Ravens game where it was ruled an interception. And I jumped out of my seat, stared right at my fellow coworker, Harris Rubenstein, Patriots fan, and said to him, see you in the playoffs, B word. You probably know what I mean. And then other coworker, Tom Downey says, Cam, that interception just got called back. And they got it. So there was a penalty on that play. Andy Dalton threw the touchdown. The rest is history. I look like a moron, like I usually do. The Bengals spoil the Ravens playoff chances. Gross, gross exchange. But Cincinnati at 28, what do they need? All right, offensive tackle, offensive guard. They didn't address offensive tackle in free agency last year or the draft. They have to, have to, have to in this offseason. Connor Williams, Orlando Brown, a couple of names to monitor there. All right, there's Cincinnati at 28. Let's take a look at 27 here. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Jameis Winston in 2017, 19 touchdowns, 11 interceptions, 69 TDs, 44 picks in his three-year career. Last year was filled with injuries with that AC joint. That shoulder was a real problem. And Ryan Fitzpatrick played quarterback for a few games. Played actually pretty well, all things considered. But Dirk Cutter coming back as the head coach is the most confusing thing for me in the world. And that's like off the X's and O's standpoint. That's just more from a coaching standpoint. The Buccaneers should have brought in somebody else. They should not have re-signed Dirk Cutter. I can't believe they did. Or they did not re-signed, just decided to bring him back. In terms of X's and O's, they need that pass rush to improve. Bradley Chubb, a name to monitor in that first round for Tampa Bay. Guys, a stud. Tampa Bay was dead last in sacks a year ago. They need to be able to rush the passer, especially in a division where you're playing Drew Brees, Cam Newton, and Matt Ryan. Safe to say. 5-11 campaign, very disappointing. All right, let's take a look at number 26 now, the Chicago Bears. I think they are on the upward trend here. Mitchell Trubisky, just an okay year. He's still getting there. He didn't have an amazing wide receiver cast of characters, if you will. Uh, Dontrell Inman, Cam Meredith got hurt, so they couldn't use the services of him. And Kevin White has been a major disappointment. Chicago might have to address the wide receiver position in the first round of the draft, and I'm sure they don't want to have to. They probably want to wait and maybe look at James Washington or Cortland Sutton, but they probably won't fall to them in their next pick. So Chicago may, might have to reach for a Calvin Ridley. They certainly have to address that wide receiver position. New head coach, Matt Nagy, I think he's a great offensive mind. I think he'll do a great job with Chicago. There you see a couple of free agent corners there, Kyle Fuller and Prince Amukamura. Both had really good years. Kendall Fuller, well, he's going to the Chiefs. Could the Chiefs try to recruit Kyle Fuller to Kansas City as well? I, I think Kansas City would have the number one secondary, even beating out Jacksonville if they were to get Kyle Fuller too. Hot take. All right, there's Chicago there at 26. Let's take a look at number 25, the Miami Dolphins. So will Ryan Tannehill come back healthy? And really, let's just think about this from a general macro question. Is Ryan Tannehill a franchise quarterback that is my question for all of you Dolphins fans out there do you believe in Ryan Tannehill or would you prefer Miami perhaps get involved with these free agent quarterbacks out there the Sam Bradford's the Case Keenum's the Kirk Cousins of the world you see the current salary cap space for them they gotta make some cuts and oh by the way they have to address Jarvis Landry because talks right now are not going well all right, so there's Miami at number 25. Let's summarize what we have so far. So, Browns, Giants, Jets, and Colts, 32 through 29, 28 through 25, Bengals, Buccaneers, Bears, and the Miami Dolphins. This is the Cam Rogers Show on this Friday morning, presented by Game Time. Get up to 60% off all those last-minute sports tickets, concert tickets, and so much more. There you see the website at the bottom of your screen, chatsports.com slash tickets. That'll bring you right to the screen to download the app. You're watching the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. Hey, how you doing? Say hello in the comments section. Where are you uh, tuning in from? Let me know. 
Appreciate everybody supporting the program. Let's move along here in our NFL power rankings. Just talked about the Miami Dolphins and the Arizona Cardinals. Well, they have a quarterback problem. There they are at number 24. That's why we have them that low despite a 2017 campaign where they had an 8-8 eight eight record. All things considered, not that bad. Had a lot of injuries to the offensive line, injuries to quarterback, and of course that injury to David Johnson. So, Carson Palmer retired. Drew Stanton is a free agent. Matt Barkley is a free agent as well. I know they want to bring back Tremont Williams at corner. He had a pretty darn, pretty darn good year. Uh, and I think they too will be in the Kirk Cousins sweepstakes, but I want to hear from you. Best option for the Arizona Cardinals at quarterback. Case Keenum, Sam Bradford, Kirk Cousins, or should they go to the draft? And here is my problem with the draft. They select number 15 overall. So that means they're going to miss out on Rosen, on Darnold, on Mayfield, perhaps even Josh Allen, too. So Steve Wilkes has talked about being pretty active in free agency. He, of course, is the new head coach there for Arizona. So I it would expect the Cardinals to be pretty active in terms of the rumors and the big-time storylines coming out of free agency this year. And I think Case Keenum could be their quarterback in week one for 2018. I could see it happening. All right, folks, throw in your thoughts. There are the Cardinals at number 24. Let's take a look at number 23, the Washington Redskins. Alex Smith, $72 million contract. you got wide receivers of Josh Dodson, Jamison Crowder, Ryan Grant, and Brian Quick. These guys aren't going to scare opposing secondaries. And then Jordan Reed at the tight end position. The guy can't stay healthy. So the Redskins, they have cap space to play with. They need to address the guard position inside linebacker and I think wide receiver too, guys. I think it would be a dream scenario for Washington to get a Sammy Watkins, somebody like that, to kind of fill that number one wide receiver void because Jamison Crowder is not that guy. There's Washington at number 23. Going to go a little quicker here so I can get to the top and spend some time there. Denver Broncos check in at number 22. It's all about Kirk Cousins for me with the Broncos, folks. John Elway is going to be pretty darn active calling out Mr. Kirk Cousins and his agent and trying to get him over to the Mile High area because Elway loves his free agent quarterbacks, and Vaughn Miller has been pretty active as well, making public pitches for Kirk Cousins to head on over to Denver. You may recall he was on the Dan Patrick Show recently saying, that Kirk Cousins would put us over the edge. And I agree. I think Denver would win the West if they get Cousins. And address the offensive line. A couple of things there. All right, Denver at number 22. Let's take a look at number 21 here. The Buffalo Bills, the question mark here. Will Tyrod Taylor get cut? It would create nearly $10 million in cap savings if they were to do so. I think they will likely be in the Kirk Cousins sweepstakes. Have to address the center position after Eric Wood unexpectedly retired due to that neck injury. Really tough situation there. I could see Charles Clay get cut. Cordy Glenn could be on the chopping block too. New offensive coordinator Brian Dable coming over from Alabama. So let us know, folks. Should the Bills cut Tyrod Taylor? Give us a heart for yes, a like for no. They should keep him. And I'm pretty sure everybody <laughs> is going to jump on that heart there and say yes, especially Bills fans, because they are growing sick of Tyrod. So the Buffalo Bills check in at number 21. Let's take a look at number 20, my Baltimore Ravens. If you are an avid watcher of the Cam Rogers show, you probably see my Flacco jersey on my desk every single Week and of course it's here today. The Ravens went nine and seven, and with a really abysmal offense, a really down year for Joe Flacco, injuries to the offensive line, and a cast of misfits at the wide receiver position. Not too bad. They almost made the playoffs, and it was almost January, Joe, and I was so excited. And that stupid Bengals game crushed me. So they got to address wide receiver. There's no doubt about it. They got to figure out who their number one tight end is. Ben Watson's a free agent. Dennis Pitta has been hurt year in and year out. It seems. And Ryan Jensen is going to be a free agent as well. They may have to take a look at the center position. The problem is they don't have a lot of salary cap space because of one Joseph Flacco, who signed that big-time contract after that magical run in the 2012 to 2013 season, winning the Super Bowl. So is Joe Flacco overpaid? Let us know in the comments section, folks. Jimmy Garoppolo, of course, 
is the top guy in terms of salary at this point at the quarterback position. But Joe Flacco at one point was the number one guy and the highest paid guy. So is he overpaid now? Are the Ravens having buyer's remorse? And especially Ravens fans. I want to let your thoughts uh, flow through the comment section here. All right, let's move along here. Number 19, Tennessee Titans. The Mike Vrabel regime has begun. Matt LaFleur coming over from L.A. to become the new offensive coordinator. Great front seven headlined by Jarrell Casey, Derek Morgan, Brian Arakpo. I expected more from that offense in 2017 with some pretty good pieces there. And Eric Decker, Corey Davis, Rashard Matthews, it just never really panned out. So we'll see what LaFleur can do with the toys out there on the offensive side. So there's Tennessee at number 19. Let's stay in the AFC South here. Check in with number 18, the Houston Texans. For me, it's all about Deshaun Watson. And reports are that recovery is going well. But the Texans have needs on the offensive line and the secondary. Jonathan Joseph not getting any younger. And he's a free agent. Kareem Jackson was absolutely awful. So we'll see what the Texans do in the draft this year. But for me, again, all about Deshaun Watson. All right, let's take a look at number 17 here, the Detroit Lions. So Matt Patricia, new head coach there in the Motor City. They have needs on that front seven, especially at tackle. They gotta be able to stop the run and rush the passer. That's why I think the priority for them this offseason, re-sign Ziggy Ansah. He has been a durability issue for sure, but still, if they see him walk, then edge rusher becomes a very massive need for the Lions. So there they are at 17. Let's summarize my way too early NFL power rankings. Browns, Giants, Jets, and Colts, the bottom four. 28 through 25, Bengals, Bucks, Bears, and Dolphins. 24 through 21 we go, Cardinals, Redskins, Broncos, and Bills. And then 20 through 17, the Ravens, the Titans, the Texans, and the Detroit Lions. All right, folks, there you go. Let's check in with number 16, smack dab in the middle. We have the San Francisco 49ers. And let me preface this discussion with ladies and gentlemen, they are going to make a big time jump up the power rankings in the next edition because I think they're gonna make some big time splashes in free agency. And I wanna know, are the 49ers a playoff team in 2018. Give us a heart for no doubt. Give us a laughing face for not quite yet. But Jimmy Garoppolo, that five-year deal, $137.5 million. He's the guy. He's the franchise. I think the Niners address wide receiver in free agency. I think they address the interior of that offensive line in free agency and edge rusher in the draft. So the Niners, they got draft capital. They got the salary cap space. They could very well be an NFC championship team. I said it back uh, a few days ago too. I think it could happen in 2018. All right, folks, throw in your reactions. I know there's a lot of Jimmy Garoppolo hysteria out there with that whole contract. All right, let's take a look at number 15 now, the LA Chargers. Secondary is legit. They got Casey Hayward, Trevor Williams, Desmond King at the slot corner position. I love that pass rushing duo with Melvin Ingram and Joey Bosa. The problem for me, can they start fast? So going 0-4 to start 2017 really put them behind the eight ball. They're going to have to start a lot quicker in 2018 if they want to make a move in the playoff hunt. By the way, address the offensive line. they got to be able to run block better for Melvin Ingram. All right, let's take a look at 14 in my power rankings. The Raiders of Oakland. They got their guy. Chucky is in town. And... Really a down year for them. Six and 10 in 2017 with Super Bowl aspirations, really disappointing. Derek Carr and that offensive line underperformed. The NFL's most expensive offensive line at that has to do a lot better in terms of pass protection for Derek Carr next season. But John Gruden's there and he'll be there for a while. So will Gruden win a Super Bowl with the Raiders? Give us a heart for someday, yes he will. Or a laughing face for no. And let me know what you think about the Oakland Raiders. The Raiders played this team last season, the Dallas Cowboys. They check in at number 13 in my power rankings. They went 6-4 and four with games with Ezekiel Elliott. They weren't as good in games without him, and that is to be expected. So obviously, they'll get a full season from Zeke. They will likely 
give Demarcus Lawrence a long-term deal. If not, franchise tag him. He's not going anywhere. You still have a really good interior of that offensive line there for Dallas. 9-7 and seven in 2017, not too bad. There they are at number 13. Let's take a look at number 12 here, the Green Bay Packers. This is about Aaron Rodgers and their ability to address the secondary. So the secondary, they got hit with a lot of injuries last season. Quentin Rollins, Kevin King, Goodson, Herb Waters. I could go down the list. Not a great cap situation either. And you know Green Bay, they don't make big time splashes in free agency, but they might have to, or at least make a couple of mid-tier moves because Green Bay needs some help for Aaron Rodgers. All right, so there they are at number 12, and they could drop, who knows. Number 11, the Kansas City Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes time, and you may recall, he played a game against the Denver Broncos last year, 22 of 25, 284 through the air, and a pick. But really, this guy has a fantastic arm talent. There's gotta be a lot of excitement swirling in Kansas City right now, I'm telling you. With Alex Smith gone, it's almost like a new era is beginning for the Chiefs. And by the way, getting Kendall Fuller at slot corner and getting Eric Berry back at the safety position, along with Marcus Peters at corner, it's going to be going to be a pretty darn good secondary, no doubt about that. So there are the Chiefs there at number 11. Let's take a look at number 10, the Seattle Seahawks. Ladies and gentlemen, the Seahawks have traded Russell Wilson. Just kidding, not the Seahawks. The <laughs> Texas Rangers actually did to the Yankees. So, all right, Seattle, in all seriousness, not a great cap space situation. Looks like Richard Sherman's going to come back. There were some rumors that maybe he would get cut, but it all comes down to the offensive line for me. Too much pressure is on Russell Wilson to perform and perform outside the pocket. And he's great at doing that, I understand. But at some point, Seattle's gonna have to look at themselves in the mirror, Seattle's leadership to be exact, and say to themselves, we've gotta pr protect our franchise. Because honestly, guys, I'm scared for Russell Wilson. I am. Because one of these days, he's not going to become as mobile. And he's going to have to become more of a pocket passer. And Seattle better have a darn good pass-protecting offensive line at that point. So there is Seattle inside the top 10. Let's take a look at number 9 here. And as we get into these single digits, we got the Atlanta Falcons. They made it to the playoffs in 2017. They went 10-6 and six in the regular season. They beat the Rams in the wild card round. Lost to the Eagles in the divisional. Matt Ryan... Kind of a Super Bowl hangover season. 20 passing touchdowns. Steve Sarkeesian as the offensive coordinator, kind of a disappointment there. No excuse for the Falcons to have a down year in 2017 when they had the same offensive cast. I just don't get it. But there they are at number nine. We're giving them a little respect for making the playoffs. We'll stay in the NFC South. Number eight, the Carolina Panthers. They lost Steve Wilkes. Cam Newton, though, at the end of the day, needs help at the running back position. Jonathan Stewart not getting any younger. Christian McCaffrey, he's a good gadget guy, but he's not a three down back. So I think Carolina will be active in free agency looking for a running back. Watch out for them. Let's go to number seven, the Minnesota Vikings. They probably shouldn't be this low, but they are because of the quarterback situation. All three of their quarterbacks are free agents. They gotta figure out what they're gonna do. All right, you got Case Keenum, Teddy Bridgewater, and Sam Bradford, all free agents. Who do they bring back? Who do they let walk? That's the big question for me. So there's Minnesota at number seven. Let's go to number six, the LA Rams, the number one scoring offense in the 2017 regular season. What a year for Jared Goff, 28 touchdowns, seven picks. Todd Gurley was in the MVP conversation, over 2,000 total yards, 19 touchdowns. That guy is a stud. Love Todd Gurley. I was raving about him all year long. The Rams are here for the long haul. Sean McVay, coach of the year, well-deserved. And by the way, current salary cap space, not too shabby. They can make some moves, but they do have to address Sammy Watkins, Tremaine Johnson, and LaMarcus Joyner, all going to be free agents. So there are the Rams at number six. Let's get inside the top five. We got the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's all about the big three, right, folks? Big Ben, Bell, Antonio Brown. Could they be the best quarterback, running back, wide receiver duo in the NFL? Big question mark there. Uh, but in terms of the X's and O's, Pittsburgh is a good running team, good offensive line, good in run blocking, but can Ben Roethlisberger continue his play? He's always been kind of a drama queen when it comes to the whole, will I retire, will I not retire, and blah, 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 maybe I just don't have it anymore. Remember he said that after that first Jacksonville game when he threw five interceptions. Le'Veon Bell, 
Pittsburgh leadership got to figure him out. Are they going to franchise tag him? Are they going to give him the long-term deal that he wants? If they tag him, it's about $14.5 million. Le'Veon has threatened to sit out all of 2018 if he does get that tag. I don't think he will. That's a lot of money. So there's Pittsburgh at number five. The Steelers played this team in the playoffs. The Jacksonville Jaguars, perhaps the best defense in the NFL, at least in terms of creating turnovers. Secondary is legit. Pass rush is fantastic. Really gave the Patriots everything they could handle in the AFC Championship game. So now the needs. Well, the offensive line. They could probably do a little better in terms of run blocking ability. They do have to make a decision with Allen Robinson. Will they give him the franchise tag? And is Blake Bortles the guy for the future? A lot of Jags fans think, well, maybe we can settle with Blake Bortles with our defense, our run game, etc. Other Jags fans out there are saying maybe we should be in the Kirk Cousins sweepstakes. We'll sh we shall see with uh, Blake Bortles and the Jacksonville Jaguars this offseason. So they're there at number four. By the way, Jags are going to be pretty darn good for the next few years. I'm confident in that. Number three, the New Orleans Saints. Drew Brees set an NFL record with a 72 completion percentage. Really fantastic year for him. Hey, he wasn't needed that much, though, through the air. 23 touchdowns, lowest since 2003 when he played for the Chargers. And they didn't need him because, well, they had a couple of pretty darn good running backs and Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara. And oh, by the way, the Saints have a couple of rookies of the year. That's right, plural, because Marshawn Lattimore and Alvin Kamara won rookie of the year for the defense and the offense, respectively. So in terms of needs for the Saints, they don't have a lot of needs. Yeah, they could beef up that front seven a little bit, perhaps look at an edge rusher as well. Maybe tight end too, but I think that's kind of pushing it. The Saints are in a pretty darn good position here. Really, the main storyline for New Orleans is what are they going to do with Drew Brees here? Is it going to be a one-year deal, two-year deal, three-year deal, etc.? That's the big time question mark for me because we know Drew wants the two-year, three-year deal. New Orleans leadership, though, they kind of prefer the one-year kick the can down the road kind of deal, right? Because Drew Brees, let's face it, guys, he ain't that young. And the Saints want to start looking ahead to post Drew Brees. Meanwhile, Drew wants that security, and I understand that. So there are the Saints at number three. Let's check in with number two, the New England Patriots. Well, Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, Robert Kraft, it looks like they are going to make another run at things in 2018. I know a lot of rumors are swirling that perhaps the dominance is over among those three and all of that. But look, New England, they're in fine shape. They're going to get Julian Edelman back. People forget about that. They do have to address inside linebacker. I think Avery Williamson is a name to watch out for. He is a free agent inside linebacker out of Tennessee. And he would be a fantastic add for New England. Nate Solder, got to make a decision with him. And Malcolm Butler, will he return to Foxborough? Another big time question there. New England, they're number two, which means this team is number one. The Philadelphia Eagles, victors of Super Bowl 52, one of perhaps the most complete team in the NFL. Offensive line is elite. That front four is fantastic. That secondary is great as well. And it's so great because of one Patrick Robinson. There you see him at the bottom of your screen. Slot corner there, he's a free agent, got to make a decision with him. Are they going to re-sign him or not? Will they let LeGarrette Blunt walk or will they re-sign him? Another big-time story there for the offseason for the Philadelphia Eagles. Should the Eagles trade Nick Foles too? That's another thing we have to think about, right? Carson Wentz probably going to come back healthy. And if he is, well, maybe the Eagles could get some good deals here for a Nick Foles trade. All right, so throw in your thoughts about that, ladies and gentlemen. Let's summarize my entire power rankings. Here we go. Browns, Giants, Jets, Colts, bottom four there. Bengals, Bucks, Bears, and Dolphins, 28 through 25. 24 through 21, we go Cards, Redskins, Broncos, and Bills. And then you got the Ravens, Titans, Texans, and Lions, 49ers, Chargers, Raiders, and Cowboys. Inside the top 10, eventually here, Packers, Chiefs, Seahawks, and the Falcons. Eight through five, Panthers, Vikings, Rams, and Steelers. And your top four, way too early NFL power rankings, Jaguars, Saints, 
Patriots and Eagles. This is the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. Follow me on Twitter at Mr. Rogers99. Leave me a comment. Let me know where you're tuning in from. We're going to hit a quick commercial break. Coming up on the other side, New England Patriots team reporter Meredith Gorman joins me to talk about the Patriots and so much more. Stick around. It's the Cam Rogers Show. Hey folks, Cam Rogers here, and we have Meredith Gorman on the line right now. She is, of course, the New England Patriots team reporter. Meredith, have you recovered? Is everything okay after that Super Bowl 52 loss? Appreciate the time. How are we doing? <laughs> hey, Cam. Yes, I am slowly recovering. It was a long week out there, but most of all, it was freezing cold. So coming back to New England, it even feels warm compared to Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. Yeah, like Minneapolis is probably like sub-zero temperatures. But let's talk about that Super Bowl experience for you. You were out there covering it, of course. What was the whole week like? So we were based out of the Mall of America, the Patriots. We did this 24-hour live streaming news network all week. And our set was basically in an empty spot in the mall, which is gigantic. Um, Radio Row is also was also based out of the Mall of America. So there was tons of people around. Um, the team hotels were both based out of the Mall of America, um, which is about like 20 minutes outside of downtown Minneapolis. So I spent a lot of time in that mall. <laughs> um, so luckily I didn't have to go outside too much. But one of the things that we wanted to do for our news network was give people back home in New England a taste of Minnesota. So as one of the reporters, I was sent out to do winter activities in Minnesota like I went cross-country skiing one day another reporter went to the middle of a frozen lake and did some activities out there um, it was cool it was different a lot different than the Super Bowl in Houston the year before that I was lucky enough to go to too um, but I think I think overall um, Personally, I would like a Super Bowl in a warm weather place because I'm in the cold for five months of the year here in Boston. But it was awesome. It was really fun. Well, hey, the good news is Super Bowl 53 in Atlanta. So if the Patriots get there, there you go. You can head back south and enjoy the warm weather there, Meredith. All right, let's talk about the X's Fingers and O's, crossed. the game itself. It was quite an offensive shootout. Nick Foles, Tom Brady, so exciting. What were your impressions of the entire game? You know, I really didn't know what to expect going into the game. I had gone to both Patriots and Eagles media availability all week heading into the game. And one thing that I noticed, even leading up to the game, is how much the Eagles offense had transitioned so seamlessly, even with the quarterback change. I mean, Nick Foles taking over, it didn't look like there was that much of a difference, as much as you would think when you lose Carson Wentz. Um and one of the things that the guys on the Eagles were all saying is how much trust there is amongst one another, and that's the reason why the quarterback transition was so seamless for them. So I knew, you know, um, this is a hungry team. They had a chip on their shoulders. They had been doubted all season long, and they're going to bring everything they have into this game. Um, you know, I also had a lot of faith in the Patriots because – especially on the defensive side, they had made a lot of stops in the matter in the moments that mattered most this past season. So going into the game, you know, I, I did think the Patriots were going to win. Uh, Tom Brady did awesome, but you could say on both sides, the defense just wasn't really there, um, which made it a fun game to watch because obviously watching offensive game, offensive having offense, heavy games is fun to watch, but um, yeah, it was it was disappointing. I mean, it really came down to the last the last couple of plays, which I feel like it always does when the Patriots are in the Super Bowl. <laughs> no doubt about that. And hey, let me ask you this, because you mentioned the whole us against the world type of mentality, which is 
pretty familiar to the New England Patriots, but it looked like the Eagles actually channeled that kind of mindset this season and almost out Patriots the Patriots, if, if you will. What do you think about that and how the Eagles kind of utilized the underdog kind of mindset and actually ended up winning the Super Bowl when everybody was doubting them? You know, I think it's a good mentality to have because it brings it brings everybody on that team together. It brings the city of Philadelphia together. I mean, if you watched the parade yesterday, I saw some clips on social media of chants, you know, no one likes us, things like that. Um, and I, well, I think it, it brings camaraderie. I think um, this Eagles team, they had been proving people wrong all season long and media outlets, as a member of the Eagles team said yesterday at the parade, media outlets had been doubting them all season. I really do think that brings them together. And as we saw last year when the Patriots won the Super Bowl, having the whole incident with Deflake that happened right before um, they had made it to the Super Bowl, I think that made the victory a little bit sweeter. So I think, you know, being doubted does add a chip on your shoulder that, that can fuel you. All right, Meredith, Does this that whole sense? Josh McDaniels thing is pretty amazing. The Colts tweet, congrats, you're a head coach. And I guess the Indianapolis Colts leadership didn't really check their DMs because McDaniels is, of course, still the <laughs> offensive coordinator there for the Patriots. What a story that is. And when you saw that news, how shocked were you? I was just as shocked as everybody else. Just from the reports heading into the Super Bowl, it seemed to me like it was a done deal that Josh McDaniels and Matt Patricia were both leaving. And with Josh McDaniels leaving, the reports were that he was taking, you know, the special teams coach, the assistant quarterbacks coach with him. So I thought, wow, there's going to be um, some adjustments that the Patriots are going to have to make this off season in order to make up for those losses. Um, so when I heard that Josh McDaniels was actually staying here, I was happy. I mean, he and Brady have a great relationship. He knows this offense. Um, and, hey, personally, I'm excited to have him back here. <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited. I'm sure you were just as equally, equally shocked. Oh, I was shocked. There's no doubt about it. I certainly wouldn't say excited because that means the Patriots are going to continue to dominate on offense, and my Baltimore Ravens are probably going to feel the brunt of that. So unfortunate news there for <laughs> non-Patriots fans, no doubt about it. Let's talk about somebody who left the Patriots via trade this season, Jimmy Garoppolo. Hey, he's getting paid now, and he's going to get paid the highest amount on a yearly basis ever. This is like unbelievable stuff. What do you make of this contract here for Garoppolo? <laughs> I think good for Jimmy. I mean, that guy has it all. Going to San Francisco, you know, it seemed – it seemed. I mean, when you're a backup quarterback, you always want to play. He always was preparing like he was the starter when he was in New England. Of course, it was so shocking to see him traded. Um, but I'm really happy for him. I just – I'm just excited to see what his paycheck does for quarterbacks in the future. I'm sure he's not going to be the last quarterback to keep getting paid. I mean, Kirk – Cousins is due for a paycheck soon. Um, but, yeah, I just think that's a crazy amount of money, but good for him. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's getting good for him. big time. Yes, absolutely, no doubt about that. Big and Jimmy time. Garoppolo, that five-year deal for him, he'll remain in the Bay Area for quite some time. All right, Meredith, so what are you expecting this offseason for the Patriots? If you want to look at needs, maybe – the inside of that defense, middle linebacker, defensive line. I want to get your thoughts about what you're expecting this offseason for New England. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell right now, but there was a lot of injuries on defense. I mean, losing Dante Hightower early in the season was a huge loss for the defense. I think having him back next season will be huge. It'll be interesting to see um, what they decide to do with some of the other guys. I know there's a handful of people up for free agency, but I just think getting the key guys back, I mean, Dante Hightower's loss was so huge for us. Having, no, not having Malcolm Mitchell was huge. Um, not having Edelman was huge. I really, I really have faith that the Patriots, they find a role for anybody, and you'd be surprised. You know, you see how many undrafted free agents are on this team making an impact, how many guys that are on this team that didn't really have an impact in their previous teams, and then they come here and make a huge splash. Um, I have faith that whoever they choose will will fit those exact roles that they need. Um, but, 
yeah, I it'll be interesting. I mean, the combine's coming up, and we should definitely catch up after that, and we'll see we'll see how things have progressed. I know it. I know it's been a busy off season though so far, and it's just started. <laughs> Stay tuned, as they say. The There's a lot news. more to go down. There's no doubt about it. All right, Meredith. I'm good sure question there is. for you here. So one of my first interviews on the Cam Rogers Show was actually Courtney Cox of Nesson. From what I understand here, you're a host on Nesson for Golf Destinations. So let me ask you this. How's the golf game? Do you play? What's the handicap? <laughs> I am terrible at golf. Honestly, I tried to golf. My brother and my family, big golfers. I'm literally, I'm terrible. <laughs> um, and my golf show, my golf show is basically just about golf courses around New England. So I'm not giving golf advice, luckily, because I don't think anybody would really want to take my advice, Cam. <laughs> All right, that's fair. Hey, it's a very hard <laughs> but, game. I'm a, go ahead. Oh, but that being said, me and Courtney Cox are great friends and she was down in Minnesota with me all week. <laughs> there you go. You got to let her know you're on the show today. She was a very fun interview, too. Um, all right, Meredith, so to wrap up here, uh, in terms of some big storylines to watch for the Patriots for the start of the 2018 year, I want some sort of bold prediction for you from you. Can you give me something? Man, I would say, obviously, watching Tom Brady, I mean, he still has a couple years left. If I had to make a, if I had to make a guess, he's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, Belichick, obviously he's going to be back. Um, those were all things that were speculated. I think at the end of the Super Bowl, people were, right. were wondering those things. Um, watching the group of wide receivers, I mean, Edelman being back, seeing how he adjusts Gronk, that is a big storyline. People are wondering, will Gronk retire? Um, there's reports of him potentially pursuing an acting career. Um, that is that's very interesting and that's one thing I definitely think might be one of the biggest stories heading into this season is will Gronk retire he kind of gave an open-ended answer to that when he was asked that leading into the Super Bowl I would hate to see him retire but we'll see what happens there <laughs> Meredith Gorman joining the Cam Rogers show here today Patriots team reporter Meredith Appreciate the time so much. I hate to tell you that I'm a Ravens fan, even though I'm from the Wingwood. But the good news is my parents, my sister, they're Patriots fans. So don't think too less of me. I'm surprised they haven't disowned you. I mean, how can you be from New England and not be a Patriots fan? <laughs> Rumors are swirling that they may disown me pretty darn soon. We shall see. Meredith Gorman, thanks so much for the time. Such a fun interview there, chatting with Meredith Gorman, of course. Patriots team reporter, and she is getting set for the offseason for New England as they hope to get to Super Bowl 53 in Atlanta. All right, folks, this is the Cam Rogers Show wrapping up the program, but we are thanking gaming uh, Game Time for uh, sponsoring today's show. Chatsports.com slash tickets to check out this app. Very simple. Get up to 60% off all those last-minute sports tickets, concert tickets, and so much more. If you are a procrastinator, get this app. You can get fantastic deals if you use it. The Game Time app. All right, so we are following a developing story. This is pretty rough. So the Boston Herald actually published a story that indicated that Tom Brady would hold out of the offseason unless he got paid the same money as Jimmy Garoppolo up front. So they published it and turned out to be a fake story. So Tom Borges, who is the reporter for the Boston Herald, or Ron Borges, I should say, published the story, and he got the source via Tom Brady's agent, at least he thought. So somebody in Boston actually prank-texted Borges posing as Tom Brady's agent, saying that Brady will hold out in the offseason if he doesn't get paid. And Borg just ran with the story. It actually went into print this morning. So it is out there in public. You can take it back online and on Twitter and all that stuff. But it's out there in print in physical, tangible form. Uh, and so <laughs> it's just a rough, rough situation there. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you got to check your sources, I guess. So uh, Borges has to uh, kind of walk back that story. And don't worry, Patriots fans, Tom Brady will not hold out during the offseason. 
All right, folks, I am wrapping up the Cam Rogers Show. I will be back here on Monday, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Enjoy your weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Follow me on Twitter at MrRogers99. Hit me up on Facebook. Be sure to download the podcast version of the Cam Rogers Show as well. And I will see you guys on Monday.